My name is Yuan. Uh, I am a software engineer at Databricks. And today, I'm going to talk about automated multi-cloud, multi-flavor Kubernetes cluster upgrades using operators. So just a quick introduction of uh, what Databricks is. Uh, we are an end-to-end -end data and AI platform. We help customers understand their data. So we run all of these workloads um, on our platform for our customers. So these include like machine learning, streaming, generative AI, data, data warehouse, ETL, uh, and many other things. All Databricks products run on Kubernetes. So we have uh, a really large footprint of Kubernetes. Uh, it's really a multi-billion dollar business that's totally run on Kubernetes. Very early on, we realized that we needed to upgrade all Kubernetes nodes uh, frequently, and in this case, monthly. So we had uh, required frequent OS security patches um, for Kubernetes nodes. So those are for compliance reasons. And uh, we had uh, Kubernetes version upgrades. So we need to uh, get invasive features from the community. We want to get uh, bug fixes and uh, also security patches on Kubernetes. And uh, we needed a way to roll out infrastructure changes. Uh, so the changes include, for example, the Node OS image. Uh, we uh, make a lot of changes to it over time. Uh, the instance type upgrades, um, updates. Um, we want to update node configurations. We want to update the launch templates of the virtual machines that uh, back the nodes. So uh, yeah, for all of these, we needed to run upgrades very frequently. And uh, usually upgrades are considered to be just some operational work. So like some engineer will just go and do it. But we soon realized that for us, uh, it was very challenging. We run on three clouds. Uh, we have AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. We have multiple regions per cloud around the world, like double digit of regions per cloud. And uh, we have four different Kubernetes flavors, AKA distros. We have uh, EKS on AWS, AKS on uh, Azure, uh, GKE on Google Cloud. And we also have our self-managed Kubernetes clusters that actually run on all three clouds. And uh, at Databricks, Kubernetes runs workloads for both internal uh, users and external customers. So it's really just everything. So we have uh, microservices, we have like serverless customer workloads, like all the serverless functions, uh, serverless SQL, UDF, uh, all of these Databricks pro uh, products, they uh, ultimately, uh, ultimately run on Kubernetes. We have uh, machine learning workloads, and that's both uh, internal and external. Um, it, uh, it includes uh, training and inference. We also run internal tools and systems. Uh, all the internal tools run on Kubernetes. For example, CICD, testing jobs, PKI, observability, uh, et cetera. So the business has uh, really grown um, in a really massive way in the last few years. And uh, that has resulted in a very large growth in workloads, both in scale and in um, the types of workloads. However, uh, with all of that, we, uh, and we have to do all the frequent updates, so we still have to do all the upgrades uh, with no downtime to uh, any of the, uh, the workloads. And for our scale, we, have, uh, we now have over 1,000 Kubernetes clusters. We have hundreds of thousands of nodes. I mean, that's just the uh, like bottom line. Like, it can be much higher. And we need, to draw, uh, we need to run monthly node upgrades for all nodes uh, in all clusters. And uh, the upgrades can be more frequent uh, in some cases, for example, when we have hotfixes, rollbacks, et cetera. Uh, so uh, assuming an engineer spends like two minutes to manually upgrade a node in Kubernetes, and that's like a very optimistic estimate, uh, so somebody just runs a bunch of commands, uh, in our scale, it would take 139 person days to upgrade all nodes at once. Uh, like, and that's uh, certainly not scalable. So uh, to be fair, we didn't start with this scale uh, a few years ago. But uh, even for the smaller scale back then, uh, it would not have been feasible to upgrade all of these manually. So uh, yeah, everything uh, basically led to automation. 
we wanted to build an automated system to upgrade nodes. So we started doing that. So here are the requirements we summarized um, to uh, build such, uh, such a system. First of all, we, uh, there, there can be absolutely no downtime or outage caused by uh, the upgrade process, like on any of the workloads. And we want it to be able to roll back easily in case of a problem. So uh, this is because when you do infrastructure updates or node upgrades, uh, like Kubernetes version, OS image upgrades, these can often cause like uh, problems. For example, the new configuration may contain bugs. The, the new version may not work properly for some workloads. And uh, you always, in that case, want to roll back immediately. We uh, wanted a consistent upgrade flow for all three clouds and four Kubernetes flavors. So we didn't want our engineers to have to run different steps to upgrade Kubernetes clusters just because they are uh, AKS or EKS or GKE or our self-managed Kubernetes or like whatever cloud they're on. And we want all of this to be uh, very low effort for our engineers. So here's the first version we built. Uh, it was an automation using off-the-shelf CI/CD. So we had a Spinnaker at Databricks. We had Jenkins, uh, like uh, like a Jenkins uh, setup. So we decided to automate this using um, a Spinnaker pipeline. And in the pipeline, every uh, every stage corresponds to um, a Jenkins job. And the Jenkins uh, the Jenkins job in this case runs um, a combination of Python and Groovy scripts. So the scripts uh, talk to the target Kubernetes clusters API server and also the cloud APIs. And uh, what they do is that they bring up new nodes and then they move the workloads over, uh, basically draining the, uh, the nodes and also uh, evicting the pods uh, until all the workloads uh, are running on the new nodes. And then uh, it shuts down the old nodes. So that basically completes the um, upgrade of a node pool. So yeah, we uh, launched this first, uh, first version of the system, but it didn't work well uh, for, many, uh, for many reasons. So it caused many outages due to, uh, first of all, it was very hard to test because we, uh, like all the upgrade logic was very complex. We had to have some, uh, like a lot of uh, custom logic for different clouds and also uh, specific workloads. Uh, so we ended up having uh, over 10K uh, lines of poorly tested Python and Groovy code. And it's inherently hard to uh, do unit testing and uh, integration, integration testing on these kind of uh, CI, CD, or workflow engines. Uh, it's just quite hard. And then uh, sometimes we would deploy the change to like a dev instance of Spinnaker or Jenkins, and then we would run, uh, try to run the uh, upgrades there. But then uh, the test coverage was very poor in general. And then it was hard to make a change that um, behaves consistently on all clouds and all Kubernetes flavors. Because when, uh, for example, if there's a change in the upgrade flow, uh, you would have to make it uh, four times on like the three uh, Kubernetes flavors provided by cloud providers and the self-managed flavor. And sometimes you have to do it three times for the self-managed flavor on three clouds. So it was very easy to make mistakes. Uh, as a result, we had very high human operational cost. Uh, we had from 100 to 150 on-call pages a week uh, just due to the upgrade process because the upgrade pipelines were failing, uh, the commands were uh, not executing, um, and also like outages were caused by the upgrade process. And uh, in general, the, the system suffered from transient and temporary failures because of the complexity of the upgrade steps. And in uh, these kind of workflow engines or CI CD systems, it's very easy to, uh, for like a temporary failure to cause the whole stage to, to fail. And then someone, some human, will have to go there and uh, manually click restart. And for our scale, we <laughs> had to do thousands of mouse clicks just clicking the failed Jenkins jobs. So uh, obviously, nobody wanted that. And uh, even worse, um, the rollbacks were often blocked due to the, uh, blocked due to the same issues because the rollbacks. They, were, uh, they would encounter the same issues uh, causing like additional outages or uh, the rollbacks could be blocked. So often the time uh, it took to mitigate incidents was very long. And we often missed upgrade deadlines uh, because of all these issues. 
So uh, after uh, operating, after having operating uh, that system for actually more than a year, we finally had enough. So we decided to do something better. So we decided to uh, build a solution using Kubernetes operators. So here's uh, our abstraction. So a node pool, uh, a node operator is uh, really just, uh, we call it the node pool rotation process. Because in Kubernetes, uh, we organize uh, nodes into multiple node pools. And for each node pool, we have the concepts of the old and the new nodes. So the old nodes are the nodes that are running a previous configuration. The new nodes are the nodes that are running uh, a, like a new configuration that we want to uh, upgrade to. So uh, what we do is that we gradually replace all the nodes running, all the old nodes in a node pool with new nodes. Um, so, and we do this for every single node pool. Uh, after that, we can uh, call the uh, cluster, we can say that the cluster has been fully upgraded. So for self-managed Kubernetes, there's a nuance here because there are also Kubernetes master nodes. However, uh, from an upgrade standpoint, uh, really the masters are not that different from the workers because the masters uh, is, uh, are just a set of nodes and we can treat them as a node pool. Um, of course, there are some nuances here. For example, uh, if you wanna do like a Kubernetes version upgrade, you should upgrade the masters first and you need to obey the version skew policies. And also when you upgrade the masters, you wanna replace one master at a time instead of replacing all of them at a time to avoid uh, downtime in uh, HA masters. And we, uh, here are some key observations that uh, led us to uh, use Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes operators. So uh, a node upgrade is declarative because the goal state is very clear. In this case, basically you just say, I want all nodes in a node pool to be running on the new configuration that I'm upgrading to. And then a rollback conceptually is actually not different from, uh, from an upgrade because a rollback is just an, an upgrade in the reverse direction. So as long as the goal state is clearly defined and the system is implemented well, there should not be additional steps or logic needed to do the rollback, uh, either in the middle of or after an upgrade, because you just reverse the direction of the node pool rotation. And uh, here's a part of our thought process back then. Um, so nobody wants to sit there and watch for upgrades. Like, Seriously, nobody wants to do that. It's a waste of time for engineers. So uh, upgrades should be a continuous background process rather than a job run by an engineer. Because like it's often, uh, you know, I, I, in a lot of places, it's like thought to be like a piece of operational work and somebody should run some job to do it, but really it should be an online process. Oh, sorry, yeah. So, uh, and it needs to tolerate temporary failures and move gradually towards the goal state. In this case, Kubernetes operators are a good choice to implement such a process. And uh, also, uh, it's very easy to write tests like unit tests and integration tests for Kubernetes operators compared to CI, CD, and Python and Groovy scripts. And, uh, and that's partially because uh, there's good ecosystem support. We, uh, all, uh, like the operators are written in Go and we have Kube Builder, we have like uh, Go mock, controller runtime, all these kind of uh, tools. And uh, another uh, point here is that we wanted each Kubernetes cluster to be able to upgrade itself. So we decided to run operators as pods with, within each Kubernetes cluster, as opposed to running them uh, elsewhere on some other piece of infrastructure. Uh, yeah, so the reason is we really want Kubernetes to be the base layer of infrastructure. If we had run uh, the operator pods for upgrades elsewhere, then we would have uh, we would have to have some other infrastructure set up to run those operators. And that would, uh, would have meant like just more um, management overhead and uh, more chances of failures. And here's the uh, high level architecture that we came up with. We have three operators working together. We have uh, something called the no pull rotation operator. That's like the central operator that's coordinating the upgrades. And we have uh, two other operators called node drain and node pool capacity operators. The node pool rotation operator interacts with uh, the, the other two operators via custom resources. So it would uh, patch custom, patch or create custom resources, aka CRs, and then check their statuses. So that's how they interact. And all the operators are built uh, using uh, the controller runtime framework. 
So it's pretty easy to define um, the CRs they watch, uh, the reconciliation loops, uh, et cetera. So let's uh, dive deep into each of the operators. Uh, the first one is called the node drain operator. So to move workloads from the old nodes to the new nodes, you uh, really want to move them safely. And the way you do it is via eviction APIs in Kubernetes. So um, in the node drain operator, it watches uh, node drain CRs. In the CRs, uh, the spec specifies a declarative state. So basically it says, we need to drain the node with uh, UID X. So why are we using UIDs? It's because in Kubernetes, the uh, node names can often be reused. So we want to uh, distinguish between different nodes that came up at different times, but like they may have the same name. And we have one CR per node and a garbage collection go routine cleans up uh, OCRs. So the reconciliation loop just uh, tries to evict all the pods using the eviction API um, in um, Kubernetes, uh, trying to ev evict all the pods on the node, and it also coordinates the node to prevent uh, new nodes from, uh, to prevent new pods from landing on the node. And if anything fails, it will just requeue and retry. So uh, a nuance here is like when any of the three operators uh, pods are evicted, uh, what happens? Because like they're doing the work, but then they have just uh, evicted themselves. So here's the good thing about declarative states, uh, because all the declarative, uh, all the goal states are clearly, uh, like for all these three operators, are clearly defined in the uh, custom resources. So when they, uh, when they are evicted, they will eventually come back again on some other node, and uh, they should be able to just do the work without having to know like that they were previously killed. So there's no state in these operators. And uh, the, goal, the only thing is the goal state that's based on the custom resource. And here's the contract between the node train operator and the workloads. And this is very important to prevent uh, outages and downtime to workloads. So the first one is PDBs. Uh, we have PDBs for most of, uh, most of the services, but uh, there are some services that just don't have PDBs for whatever reason. Maybe they forgot or uh, it was a mistake or like they just didn't have time to add it or like for some practical reason, reasons, they just like can't have it. So in that case, uh, the node train operator actually internally has something called a, def a default internal PDB with a max unavail unavailable equals one. And that is enforced to uh, like onto all workloads uh, without PDBs. So that uh, reduces, like minimizes the chances of uh, misconfigurations causing unplanned outages. We also have uh, service, uh, service specific configurations. Uh, we have uh, something called the maintenance windows. So it's like my services pods can only be evicted on Fridays from 9 to 10 p.m. Pacific. Um, so this uh, is often used by services that can't tolerate any replica being down or are single replica. So like there are applications, multi-replica applications that we have that just can't tolerate any replica being down for some application specific reasons. And they would use this to have planned downtime. And uh, we also have grace periods. So it's like, uh, give my pod eight hours to finish. If it's not done by then, evict it. So the, uh, the purpose of this is to uh, uh, ensure that, for example, jobs running in the Kubernetes clusters are not prematurely uh, terminated because of the upgrade process. We also provide a custom handler framework uh, that's like written in Golan as part of the node drain operator code. So service teams can uh, build their own logic to migrate their workloads. For example, I would like my uh, inference pods to not be evicted using the eviction API, but redeployed by making a request to the uh, orchestrator service for machine learning uh, based on application level signals. And uh, the second operator we have is called the notebook capacity operator. So it talks to the cloud provider and uh, it asks these VMs for nodes in a Kubernetes node pool. So it has two CRs. One is uh, basically increasing the size of a node pool. And the interesting point here is that the operator cannot decrease the size of a node pool directly. Uh, and I'll talk about that uh, soon. And then the operator will call the cloud APIs to add VMs to a node pool if the desired size of a node pool is higher than what it currently has. And uh, it has another thing called the node termination CR. So tell me which node's VM you want to delete based on the UID. Well, it will go to the uh, cloud uh, API to find the corresponding, corresponding VM and terminate the specific VM. 
So uh, we only have this, and we don't have a way to scale down uh, the no pools based on the desired count. And the reason is that is like we want, we really only want to terminate the nodes that have been successfully drained and uh, cordoned by the node drain operator. If we just decrease the desired count of a node pool, often it would just randomly shut down nodes, and those nodes may have actually active workloads running on them. So that's why we don't allow just like a random scale down, but we only allow um, specific VMs to be terminated. And this operator, node pool capacity, that's where we hide all the differences between clouds and flavors. So it has different APIs to uh, scale up a node pool and terminate VMs based on um, the flavor and the cloud, for example, AKS, EKS, GKE, and self-managed Kubernetes. And um, it abstracts all of these differences from the other operators. So uh, the other two operators are totally operating on the Kubernetes level and are totally cloud agnostic. And now let's go to the last operator, which is called um, no pool rotation operator. It, uh, at its core, it has this algorithm called the blue-green rolling upgrade. So it maintains two cloud stacks. Well, the, uh, so we always have like multiple stacks per node pool. And then, uh, yeah, like they, uh, we have two stacks mapping to the same logical node pool. So rather than trying to do a surge upgrade within one stack, let's say we have like on AWS, we have one ASG, and then we do like a surge upgrade where we temporarily increase the size of the ASG uh, like, and then we gradually move the workloads over. Rather than doing that, we have two stacks, aka two ASGs, and then we scale one up and scale the other one down gradually while we move over the pods, uh, move the pods over gradually. Uh, and uh, there are some benefits to this, I'll explain later. And uh, it gradually replaces old nodes in small batches. So it never replaces all of them at once. Uh, instead, it's like in very small batches, and the batch size is tunable, and this allows us to control the speed of the node upgrades. It also reduces our chances of getting into, let's say, quota issues during upgrades, and it limits the blast radius of uh, node misconfigurations. So let's say our new configuration has a bug um, because it only does so in small batches, like only, well, like, uh, only a small number of nodes will be affected uh, with the bug in the new configuration, and then we'll know and we'll roll back. Here's the uh, reconciliation loop of the no pool rotation operator. So it uh, does this coordination between itself and the other two operators. It looks at the uh, CR, basically it's called the no pool rotation CR. Uh, the CR says we need all nodes in a no pool to be running this configuration. And then it keeps uh, watching and listing all the nodes in the no pool. It replaces all uh, like old nodes in the no pool with new nodes in small batches. And it does so via uh, by, by patching and creating CRs to the uh, two other operators that I mentioned. So it will first patch the node pool capacity CR to add some new nodes, and then it will create node drain CRs to drain um, that batch of old nodes and cordon them, and then it will create node termination CRs to kill the drained old nodes. And after each batch, it will do some health checks based on application-level signals, cluster-level signals, uh, and uh, cloud-level signals. If it can't make any progress for some hours, or encountered unrecoverable errors, or detects the cluster is unhealthy, then it will alert our on-call via pager duty. But it will just like keep running in this loop um, until uh, all nodes uh, are running the new configuration. So you might wonder with, uh, with this uh, system, like how is it different from cloud uh, managed Kubernetes node uh, like auto upgrade features? I know some cloud providers, they provide that for their Kubernetes products. So uh, the main reason is that uh, this system works consistently with the same behavior across three clouds and four Kubernetes flavors. So it works for both uh, self-managed and cloud-managed Kubernetes, and it has exactly the same upgrade behavior. In, uh, for example, in like, cloud-managed Kubernetes, uh, in the node uh, auto-upgrade features, let's say in AKS and GKE, they actually work differently. They have different rules to uh, drain uh, nodes to evict pods. And uh, that can cause issues for us because there can be unexpected behaviors on one cloud compared to the other cloud. And uh, another thing is what I mentioned, we, have, we always maintain two stacks. The old nodes cloud stacks, for example, the ASGs, VMSSCs, MIGs uh, on the three clouds are kept for a while. 
So this allows uh, us to reliably re do rollbacks. The reason is that in cloud managed node uh, auto upgrades, a rollback, a rollback may fail if a node group is, uh, is in a broken state, causing prolonged disruptions. So for example, uh, if you have a misconfiguration in your, new, uh, in your new nodes, like in the OS or in the user data script in a launch template, the nodes may fail to join the cluster. And then uh, in some cloud provider Kubernetes, that will actually result in the uh, managed node pool to enter a broken state. And in that case, you can't even roll back unless you manually clean it up. So uh, in our case, we can immediately roll back by scaling up the previous stack. So it's, uh, it's very quick, and it does not require pushing the old configuration again to the cloud. And we support customizing upgrade behavior for each workload based on application level signals. And that's just not possible for cloud-managed uh, auto upgrades because they don't have visibility into the nuances our specific workloads have. And uh, the system can continuously replace non-conformant nodes. Uh, so we have like, uh, for example, sometimes people scale up nodes running the old configuration by mistake. Or uh, we've seen like sometimes the autoscaler had some bugs that it, in, uh, it like incorrectly scaled up um, nodes with the old configuration. The system is always online and you will be able to detect all these uh, like non-compliant nodes in real time and immediately run the uh, rolling upgrade to uh, replace them with new nodes. And here's the new SOP uh, standard operating procedure uh, we have uh, with uh, the new system. So the engineer will just do a one click. It, it basically triggers some update orchestrator. We've had multiple versions of this. It's a very simple system. So like it's like some, some simple Spinnaker pipeline, Argo workflow, or some custom service. It will just patch the, uh, all the no pre rotation CRs in all clusters, basically saying, I want all of you to be running our new configuration for this month. And then uh, the engineer really just forgets about the upgrade. Like, they don't even have to care about it. They'll just continue doing other pieces, for, uh, pieces of work. And uh, in the background, all the operators in all clusters uh, just work together to gradually upgrade all the nodes to the target configuration. And we only have human intervention when something goes wrong and we get alerted. Uh, so uh, the system can automatically make, pro uh, make progress if uh, a blocker is resolved. Let's say there's some uh, issue on the cloud provider side that uh, caused the upgrade to fail. Um, so we don't have to do anything really. We file some support ticket to the cloud and they will resolve the issue. And then uh, the system will automatically proceed because it's, it's based on operators. They're always reconciling regardless of failures. So there's no need for someone to go there and uh, send some a command or some click to tell the system to, uh, to resume. And for rollback, we just trigger an upgrade back to the old configuration. There's really no special uh, SLP for doing rollbacks. Um, it's just an upgrade, like I said, back to the old configuration. And here are the results. Uh, we fully automated the upgrade process at Databricks. We eliminated more than 99% of the workload outages caused by the upgrade process compared to the first version. I mean, the Spinnaker and Jenkins automation that we had. And uh, so we almost never get paged uh, for these kind of issues. And we've been consistently upgrading uh, more than a thousand clusters, hundreds of thousands of nodes every month since late 2022. Uh, that's when we launched the system while the Kubernetes fleet uh, scaled 5X. And we, uh, we are using it to roll out most of the infrastructure changes actually at Databricks. So anything that can be rolled out using the no pull rotation concept, we use uh, this system to roll, uh, roll it out. And uh, it can easily onboard new workloads uh, that are protected during upgrades because the node drain operator, like I said, we had this uh, interface with multiple ways to support and protect workloads. So it's very easy to onboard new types of workloads. And here's a company blog post uh, where you can find more details uh, about this system. And lastly, uh, we are actively hiring at Databricks. So uh, yeah, if you're interested, just go to our website and, and you can also connect to me uh, on LinkedIn. 
right, so that concludes the presentation. Now it's Q&A, so there's a QR code. Uh, feel free to scan it to provide feedback to the session. It's uh, much appreciated. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So the question was how we handle master upgrades on uh, cloud provider Kubernetes. So in cloud, uh, in cloud provider Kubernetes, uh, really the upgrade is managed by the cloud providers. And the way you trigger that is by uh, either setting up some auto upgrade schedule or uh, sending some API call to the cloud provider. Uh, so all we need to do is that we actually have some special logic. So in the no pool uh, rotation operator, it will check the um, like master version. So if the master version is already uh, a version that, for example, let's say you want to upgrade your nodes to 1.30, but your master is still on 1.29, it will just be spinning there and waiting. And then if, the, if, it, if it detects that the master version is already 1.30 1 uh, or higher, then it will just proceed with the worker node upgrades. So, uh, and then the, the API call is actually sent by the uh, uh, we've had multiple iterations by the uh, orchestrator of the upgrade. It's like a simple, still like a simple workflow engine, but because it's just one API call per cluster, usually it's pretty easy. And for some other clusters, we have auto upgrade set up, so we don't even have to do anything. So the operators will just be spinning and checking for uh, version skew compliance. Yeah, yeah, so like there can be, uh, it's called, we call it like invalid PDBs. For example, they can have like max unavail unavailable equals zero. So we actually have some, uh, there are two things. Uh, so we have some configuration uh, check in our configuration system that, you know, try to uh, gate against that, uh, but it can happen. Uh, so when it happens, we will know and we will like recommend, uh, ask the teams to use the, uh, either the maintenance window that I mentioned or uh, like basically the maintenance window that I mentioned. So because like when a PDB, when they specify a PDB that has like um, no, like that allows no pod downtime, it basically is saying, oh, like my workload cannot have any downtime. And in that case, really the only way to upgrade is uh, via planned downtime. So they can configure it that way. Uh, and we also have alerts on like, for example, if like somebody just like unintentionally uh, pushed like a bad PDB, we have alerts on that as well. Because like it will make, sh it will result in the no pull rotation operator not being able to make progress for like forever and we'll be alerted on that. Kind of related to that question, yeah. like what if you have a PDB that tolerates 50% disruption yeah. at that point in time, the application is 50% down? Yeah, yeah. So it will just be spinning, it will just be waiting. But like because we, uh, the whole process is like infinitely retriable and it's always running in the background. Uh, I mean, it's fine to be spinning for hours or even days because we have this monthly deadline. We just have to meet the monthly deadline. So yeah, if we need it to be faster sometimes, like we will get alerted for that because we can tune uh, the, th the threshold of alerts. So we can be alerted on that and then we can work with the teams to block that, if, like, unblock that if there's like uh, an emergency. Oh. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I, I guess I forgot to repeat the question. Yeah, I'll repeat it. So the question is, did you ever consider using Carpenter? Yeah, for a Carpenter? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, yeah, the question was like, uh, did we consider using Carpenter? No, we didn't because like, yeah, just we didn't use that because of various reasons. We, for like self-managed Kubernetes, we actually, we actually have a very customized setup that's like, difficult to, like it's totally from scratch, so it's hard to uh, set it up using some external tools. Uh, and then we use EKS, AKS, GKE, so all those things work out of the box. Uh, creation of clusters? Yeah, so there are, is a lot of automation. Uh, there is like, there are system that, uh, systems that 
provision clusters quickly. We've actually done a lot of work on being able to provision new clusters quickly and reliably. So including bootstrapping the cluster itself and also bootstrapping its dependencies, for example, the PKI side of things, the certificate distribution, and also being able to deploy the uh, essential services to new clusters reliably. So we've done uh, quite a lot of work on that as well. Hey, quick question. Yeah. Uh, how do you validate a cluster is ready to upgrade given uh, API deprecations and so forth? How, how can you ensure that the workload yeah. is not going to break? Yeah, so there is some coordination between different clusters. Uh, there's the, uh, we actually divide our clusters to, uh, we don't really like trigger, it's like a little bit simplified in the talk. We don't really trigger upgrades on all clusters at the same time at the beginning of the month. We do have like deployment stages. So we have like dev and staging and production environments. So we'll try the upgrades in dev first and then in staging and prod. So. Uh, and then uh, if there are issues, uh, we have a lot of health checks in the operators. So um, for example, if there are like API problems, like the teams will be alerted because their, you know, the, their clients will be failing in one way or the other. Are any integrations for like uh, Cube Node Trouble or Upgrade Insights to validate before trying in dev or QA uh, to validate? As I was the first part of the question. Uh, any integration or features set for like Cube Node Trouble to validate, hey, all these APIs are going to break before uh, you're trying the upgrade in dev? Yeah, yeah, we do have validations before we even try to upgrade in dev. Uh, it's uh, unfortunately, as far as I know, it's a, a fairly simple process, so it doesn't really cover, like, catch all the issues. It's just because the uh, surface area of Kubernetes APIs that we use is, like, very large. You mentioned that you have a component both to scale down node pools, but as well to scale them up. Does that mean you have your completely own implementation of a cluster autoscaler? Yeah, so uh, it's a, an interesting problem, like working uh, the upgrade process, working with the cluster autoscaler. I uh, didn't cover that in the slides, but there is careful coordination between that and the cluster autoscaler. So the way it works is that in cluster autoscaler, you have this, uh, this thing called the priority expander config map. So during the upgrade, we will uh, gradually shift the weight of the new stack in the priority expander config map so that the cluster autoscaler will also gradually prefer scaling up new nodes uh, in the new stack as opposed to the old stack. So it's possible that we may get like, uh, you know, uh, old nodes scaled up by cluster autoscaler, but because we uh, gradually shift the expander config map while we uh, continuously uh, like drain the old nodes and replace them with new nodes, eventually it will converge to a state where you have all the nodes being the new nodes and then you have the priority expander config map always pointing to the new stack. Uh, how do you handle data for your self-managed Kubernetes clusters? Where does the data live? I mean, how, uh, how, how do I handle, how do we handle data? So do you have data attached to your worker nodes? Are you, yeah. like, how do you replace the nodes and not worry about the data that's on directly attached to the nodes? Uh, yeah, I see. Yeah, so like the, uh, uh, so there are workloads using, uh, you know, like storage, especially if they're using like local ephemeral, ephemeral storage, then it's tricky. Uh, so often it requires, uh, I mentioned there's like the, uh, some custom handler uh, framework that we provide to workloads. Uh, usually, for example, for some databases, like uh, when you do eviction uh, of one of the workers, you actually want the, uh, the new worker to be up on a new node, and you want it to like, fully replicate the state before you can drain another one. So that's, how we, that's why we have this custom uh, logic that we allow teams to build so that they can build that like, to ensure that it's always safe from their application standpoint. So, so you don't worry about the data? The teams respond. So, sorry, so you don't worry about the data. It's the team's responsibility to make sure the data is replicated before they're replaced? Yeah, because it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's very different for different applications, right? Uh, so part of the responsibilities will be on the team, and our team mainly focuses on making sure that the new nodes always have the ability to store data. And then the replication is, like, very application-specific. Okay, thank you. How about now? Okay, there we go. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. I, very, very cool stuff. Um, one of the questions I had, though, when architecting and coming up with this scheme, 
where did you draw the line with cloud APIs doing some of the work and mm -hmm. you doing the work? Because yeah. that, that seems to be like a, a really fine line there where, where EKS can do some of the stuff, but not as well as if you control yes. it all yourself. So how did you think about that particular problem when yeah. you did this? So uh, there are two things. One is the uh, master upgrade, like in uh, EKS, AKS, and GKE. So that totally falls down to the responsibilities of the cloud providers. So we just you know, issue API calls for them to do the upgrades. And then for the worker node upgrades, we try to push the differences all the way down to the uh, VM level. So uh, as you see in the presentation, in the notebook capacity operator, it really just talks, talks to the VMs and the VM SSCs, ASGs, um, mix. It tries to uh, manipulate those APIs to uh, increase and decrease the counts of uh, node pools. And uh, we try to avoid uh, using like more uh, cloud specific and uh, cloud provider Kubernetes specific features to do these kind of things. Uh, for the reason I mentioned, we have like different flavors, different distros. So it would be hard to ensure consistency that way. So just try to push all the things down and the, uh, really just manage the uh, VMs directly. Yeah. Uh. Hi, how do you handle upgrades to cluster add-ons like Core DNS and QProxy? Yeah, so, um, so it's, uh, this is a kind of, uh, like a different process from uh, here because like in different uh, flavors, uh, they are managed differently. For example, in uh, EKS, like you can have this thing called the managed add-ons where if you upgrade, you can issue API calls to uh, uh, like EKS for them to upgrade that for you. And then in uh, some other clouds and self-managed for sure, like there's no way to do that kind of uh, upgrade um, like uh, automatically, right? You have to try to orchestrate the upgrades yourself. So uh, yeah, uh, the way it works is that uh, we have a different process. Uh, so sometimes, um, so it's more about uh, like the critical add-ons are considered to be part of the control, the master upgrade process. So we want, uh, want to make sure that actually all the critical add-ons have been upgraded fully before we can actually do the node upgrade. Of course, like for QProxy, we'll have to go with the node, but like for, let's say for Core DNS, it's like, it has to, uh, we, we bundle it with the master upgrades. Uh, just to follow up to Matt's question, so just very specifically, uh, for example, in the EKS implementation, you do not use EKS managed node groups as that would compete with the, what the operator does, correct? You just use ASGs directly? I mean, we do use the managed node groups and it actually doesn't really, compete with what the operator does because, uh, I mean, the, uh, there's a nuance. Like, I think the, the difference we see here is that it's hard to terminate a specific VM in an EKS node, a managed node group. Uh, but otherwise, I think it's been fine. Like, as long as, long as you don't enable, like, a lot of the managed features. Uh, so, like, for virtual machines, for example, if you want to kill, like, a specific VM, in an EKS managed node group, it's tricky. And then the way we do this is like, we actually on EKS, there's a special handling for these kind of things. After we have drained and fully evicted a node, we uh, actually don't kill the VM uh, for managed node groups. Like we, uh, we actually like give it like, a, we annotate all the other nodes, the other old nodes to prevent them from being scaled down by the cluster autoscaler. And, but then we, uh, for the nodes that we have cored and then drained, we don't have the annotation. So cluster autoscaler will actually take care of it because there's no workload on it. So that's like a special handling for uh, managed node groups on EKS. But like if you update a managed node group with like a new launch template, mm -hmm. doesn't that trigger like a rolling update of nodes in your Kubernetes, in your EKS cluster? Oh, uh, so yeah, so we, uh, yeah, so that's why we have two stacks, right? It's not one managed node group. We have like actually two managed node groups Got for it. the same logical node pool. So we actually never upgrade the launch template of one node pool, but then we always create a new one. But the new one, the nodes have the same labels and chains and annotations. So they'll map like from a Kubernetes standpoint, uh, it belongs to, a, uh, to the same node pool. Got it, thank you.